Hello and welcome back to Spirit Sherpa Minis. I am your host, Kelly Spada, the Spirit Doctor. And for some reason, I'm being from Massachusetts today. <laughs> Kelly Sparta, the Spirit Doctor, yes. So uh, today we're going to talk about offerings. And I got this question from Gaming Thea. That's how her email comes through. I'm assuming it's a woman. Uh, Thea sounds female to me. Uh, And if I misgendered you, Thea, I apologize. But um, uh, the question came in of how do we deal with offerings? What are appropriate offerings? How do you make uh, safe offerings, especially if you're doing like blood magic or energy magic and stuff like that, right? So uh, for and offerings to, you know, deities and other uh, entities, I'm trying to remember what the spirits and deities is what she asked for. And so let's start with what is an offering? An offering is, it's a, uh, it's, it's a bribe. <laughs> Okay. An offering is a bribe. It's a bribe offered with reverence. And, uh, you know, um, uh, it, it's, it, it's an exchange, right? It's you're giving the entity or the spirit something in exchange for them giving you what you want. So it's like, I'm going to give you this thing and you give me this thing. So it's a trade, but The idea is that the offering should be commensurate with the request. And the longer it takes you to give the offering from the time you made the request and potentially got what you asked for, the larger the offering needs to be. As I'm saying this, I'm thinking, you know what? If you just got a book on Japanese gifting, and the rules around Japanese gifting, they're very much in alignment with offerings, okay? So if you could find a book on it, that would probably be your best indicator. There's this great story about this guy who, uh, he was working for uh, the military. He was in the military at the time that the Japanese were doing their reconstruction after World War II. And he, gave this big contract to this guy's family, to this Japanese guy's family that saved their family's business and set their family up for success for generations to come. And yet in Japanese culture, because the guy was just doing his job when he gave that, that, col- that contract to the other guy, there, it was inappropriate for him to get a gift as a thank you. And so the guy instead asked this guy to come and stay with him after he got out of the military, the Japanese man invited the, the military guy to come and stay with him and his family. Um, or no, no, my apologies. The, the, uh, the American guy invited the Japanese guy to his house and the Japanese guy gave him a token gift, just a very tiny gift uh, as a thank you for the stay. It was a much smaller gift than it should have been. And as he handed it to him, he said, I would not want to pay this too soon. And the, the, the American was a little confused, but he was like, okay. 10 years later, the Japanese guy sends over 10 Japanese cherry trees worth $10,000 each as a thank you for the quote unquote stay, not as a thank you for setting up my business because he couldn't do that but he wanted to give the thank you. And so that's how he managed it, right? But the idea is that he waited 10 years to pay for the quote unquote stay. And that allowed him to give the level of gift that he wanted to give as a thank you. This is the, what I say is the longer you wait, the bigger the gift has to be, okay? So uh, I've told a story on here before about how I felt like I had been summoned to Richmond and I had to break the summoning because I, as I felt into it, uh, you know, it's supposed to be to clear the roots of of racism in the US and all of that. And, and I had to break the summoning because I, as I felt into it, I was supposed to be the sacrifice and I was unwilling to be the sacrifice. And I act, you know, I, I unconsciously, you know, I wasn't being conscious about this, but I, I asked 
Oshun to, you know, bring these, uh, the people who summoned me, uh, an understanding of the difference between justice and retribution. And evidently Oshun did, because three years later, or two years later, I was getting contacted by people, by, by priests, you know, uh, uh, voodoo priests around the world, uh, ifas, sorry, I knew I was taking the wrong word, voodoo ifas around the world, random people not associated with one another who were saying, Oshun, you need to make this offering to Oshun and I'm going to tell you how to do it and you need to do this. And because Oshun was yelling at them because she wasn't getting through to me because I don't usually talk to the voodoo uh, Orishas. And so when the time came, it was two years later and I'm like, okay, I hear you. I will go do, I'm, I'm good. And so I had to go and make a big offering. I had to create a beautiful altar and, and do this large space in the center of my kitchen in the main area that we use for everything. And I kept it up for a week in a beautiful altar and I fed it and I, I nurtured it every single day. I took care of it to, to give my offering to her because I was late in saying thank you. Okay. So when I say it, it matters how long it takes. It matters how long it takes, right? So when you think about an offering, you want to think about what is the size of the thing I'm asking for and what is an appropriate exchange for that? If you're working with a spirit animal, oftentimes if you ask them for something, they will ask you to do something in return for them. So if you ask for something from rabbit, they may say, well, you need to be vegetarian for a week. You need to eat no meat for a month, whatever, right? Or for so long as you want to use this from me. And because they usually lend you their abilities, right? Um, and so, you know, rabbit is great for fertility, right? It's like, oh, you, you want to get pregnant? and you're having a hard time, go to rabbit. Rabbit will loan you fertility energy, but you're going to have to offer rabbit something in return. And the, the, the spirit will usually tell you what they want. And so, you know, you have to decide whether or not what they're asking for is worth it to you. That's, that's the first thing, right? And then you also have to think about how long you're asking for it for and how big of an impact will it have on you and how much effort does it take on the part of the spirit or the, or the deity. And, you know, all of these things build into it. But, you know, it, it, there are certain entities that are known for certain things, like Papa Legba is known for rum and cigars. And, um, but, you know, the fairies like milk and honey, you know? But if there's not something specifically associated with that deity or that entity, then you just ask them and they will tell you what they want. And then you decide whether or not you think it's a fair trade. And if it's not, you take your request off the table. It's that simple. So let's talk about blood magic and energy magic for a minute. I mean, if you're going to give a piece of your energy or you're going to give some of your blood to something, you are binding yourself to that thing. And that is significant. So what I'm going to say is if you had to listen to everything up until this point, you are not ready to do blood or energy magic. Okay. You need to really grasp in great detail and understanding, like lawyer brain understanding, have the contract that you are making with the entity or the spirit before you offer something that's significant. If you are not already, if I would, I would say if you got here and you learned anything new between there and now, you shouldn't be doing this kind of magic yet. If you went, yep, 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 yep. You might know enough to do this, right? And, and at that point, then it's about recognizing that blood and energy connects whatever it is you're using it for to you on a level that takes a significant effort to break. And that effort may in fact have to come from both sides. And so it puts you at the other thing's whim, 
uh, mercy, whatever, right? So be careful, young Jedi, right? Be careful, grasshopper. This may not be your best option. And in fact, I have only ever used blood magic twice in my life. One was a declaration from myself where I was not committing to anyone else. And the other was an emergency break glass in case of emergency situation where I was being the safety for somebody on a vision quest. And I wanted to make sure that if he got lost, I could bring him back. And I had absolute confidence that he would release the, the spell from his side as well. And I never had to implement it because he got back no problem. And I was only going to use it if I couldn't get him back any other way. So if that tells you anything, is that, you know, I've used it twice in my life and, and not actually used it once. <laughs> and the other time was for me. So yeah, I don't recommend it. It's, it's significant. Um, and yes, there are places for it. It can be done, but you got to really want it. And you got to be really willing to live with the, with the consequences. Okay. I think this one went a lot longer than normal. So my apologies. <laughs> Probably could have done a whole episode on this, but uh, you know, bonus for you. Have a good one. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you anything, but if you like it, like it, like, rate, and subscribe. All right. <laughs> have a good one. We'll see you next time. <laughs>